Hi everybody, thank you for coming. So today I want to talk about uh, raising your IPO. Uh, sorry, ICO. It's very similar to IPO itself. The difference is that uh, when you're raising an IPO, you're a big company already. You have already proven yourself and you're going to the market, you're going to the exchange and asking for money. In an ICO, it's a little bit different. What you are telling is that uh, I have got a huge vision and I want to raise money for myself. And if you give me enough money, I will be sure to bring you back the product. So having said that, one of the most important things I would say is that you need to do your homework before you think about an ICO. It's not a simple game plan where you say, I'm going to deploy it to the Ethereum blockchain and I'm going to get all the money. It's, it's not that easy. You have to prove yourself first. You have to tell the world that why they're going to, going to be willing to pay you the money. So, first of all, your homework before the ICO itself should be that you need to write a white paper. But what is a white paper? With a white paper, you're telling everybody that this is the vision that I have for the product. This is how I'll bring it to the market. And this is the amount of money that I need to go to the very end. If you give me $100 million, for example, I will be sure to bring you the product. You need to explain why that is achievable through a blockchain itself. Now remember, we are talking about of blockchain. So the difference over here would be that you need to explain yourself that why is it really good to do it over the blockchain and not a traditional database system. Because databases themselves can save all that data. So now, how is your company different? Next thing, um, this is, I would say the world has changed quite a lot since last year or so. I would say now you have to have a product before you go out and tell that this is my vision, give me the money. Not everybody is going to give you $100 million just because you have a vision. You need to prove it that this is the product that will get even better with all the money that I need. Next thing, it's not a traditional company as well. You're going out to the market. You need to tell the people that, hey, this is good. You need to interact with them. You need to explain to them. Every person will have different sort of questions for you. So it's not a simple FAQ section on the website that will be helpful. You have to go out, talk on Twitter. You have to explain yourself on Medium. You have to have all sorts of blogs and presence in the market. Uh, finally, you need to, actually, not finally, you need to list yourself on an exchange as well. It's not New York Stock Exchange or CME that will be holding your ICO. You need to run it on a different website. So one of the latest exchanges would be, I would say, Binance maybe and Coinex. Uh, does anybody know how much does it charge for you to list yourself on an exchange like Binance, for example? I only came to know this recently, so it's really frightening. Just to list yourself, just to list your current, uh, coin, it takes $4.7 million. So even before you have some money in your wallet, you're going to be spending 4.7 million. So that is the reason why I said that before you do all of that, do your homework very well. And obviously it has to be legally sound. You can't come up with a new Napster just because it is on the blockchain. It will go down eventually. <coughs> I was talking about how the world has changed since last year. We, I'm not sure, uh, does anybody over here have heard about uh, Vitalik Buterin. So he came up with this concept of DICO. Now over here, it's very different than ICO. With an ICO, what you're saying, give me 100 million, I will go back, make the product, come back to you, with everything being done for you. So obviously there have been cases where somebody goes back and then never comes back with the product anymore. The product is gone, the money is also gone. No product, thank you for your money. So, DICO is where it is saying that um, the investors will get the control back. The investors get to decide how much money 
and how often they're going to give you the money. Also at the same time, let's say six months down the road, your success is not really good. You're trying really, really hard, but you're not getting through. Your company is not able to come up or convert that vision into a real solid product. So the investors can say, let's self-destruct and I'll take all the money back. So everybody gets the money back. So Daiko is really good in that sense. Is that the end? I don't think so. I think the world will in evolve towards Daiko. There are already some implementations uh, on GitHub, um, and there are some private uh, setups as well that do this uh, already. However, in the long run, what I believe is that the world will change to a place where individually everybody will get to decide whether they want to continue giving you the money or not. So it's not every investor 100% in or out. It will be you deciding whether you want to be in or out at different stages, any stage you feel like. So that part has not been done yet, but uh, there's a, an interesting concept called coin governance system uh, that is very similar to what I'm talking about. So maybe you can read upon that. Uh, um, by the way, I forgot to mention initially that uh, all of the source code, all of my presentation will be available. I'll give you the links right after the talk. It will be on the last slide. So don't have to worry about taking the photos. You're good. Um, okay, so let's talk about solidity. What is it? It's a programming language with which you will write your code that will be deployed on blockchain. Initially, all of your code will have to be written in solidity because solidity is the language, is the platform where, where you go write your code that will be going into the Ethereum blockchain. But to manage all of that source code in Solidity, that can be done in Python. So Solidity code by itself, I would say the longest ones I've seen are maybe 300, 400 lines. But if you are just getting into it, if you're even doing your ICO, it can be done in 10 It's really straightforward to get into. If you have done JavaScript before, it's, it's a very easier version, version of JavaScript however much more readable. It almost reads like English language. One of the good platforms is Open Zeppelin, where they give you the smart contracts that you, will, you might need for your ICO, for example. You can have different scenarios, and they have already written it. It's all open source. It's available on GitHub. You can go over there, look at the smart contract, and then start from there. So let's say you want to create your own ICO. In fact, most of them, have been using Open Zeppelin. Another one in the market uh, that has been really open is Consensus as well. Um, after that, if you want to figure out and play around, you can go on GitHub. Today is not a tutorial about Solidity, so I won't tell you how to write Solidity code. Like I said, it's JavaScript, fairly easy. You can, you can be done with just going through Open Zeppelin. Now, let's talk about uh, smart contracts. Some examples over here. Um, two of my favorite ones, I'll pick those ones. ERC20 and ERC223. ERC20 is the most basic uh, smart contract that helps you run ICOs. The reason why it's good is because, let's say you have raised an ICO, you are going to a website like Binance, you're telling them that, hey, I want to list myself on your exchange. The exchange doesn't have to think about how to put in money into your wallet, how to withdraw all that money, how to pay people, how to take token out of your ICO. It's a very standard way. So kind of like um, buy, sell, you get functions like that through ERC20. And again, that is available on Open Zeppelin. Another one is uh, ERC-223. There were some problems with ERC-20, where let's say you're trying to buy something, and you go to the exchange and tell them, or you write your code to buy something. What happens is that you end up uh, making the payment to wrong channels sometime. And uh, because it is the Wild West, you don't really come to know whether it went to the right channel or not. 
until uh, thousands, millions of your dollars are already gone. And the worst is yet to come. You never get it back because it's gone. There's nothing holding that money anymore. So once you send it out, it's done forever. So ERC-223 is a other level above ERC-20, helps you take care of some of the problems. So coming back to our source code setup, what would you require to get started? I've listed four over here. The first two are fairly basic. Uh, PySolC is actually a wrapper around the SolC, the Solidity compiler. Once you write your code in Solidity format, you need to compile it into bytecodes. And those bytecodes are the ones that will be deployed into the blo Ethereum blockchain setup. So PySolC is needed for that. Um, SolHint, I would say, is very similar to Flake 8 in Python where you have written some source code, but you're not really sure whether it's going to be perfect or not. Obviously, it still doesn't save you from a potential attack, but it can tell you that, hey, you have made a very simple mistake about uh, calculation. Please go and fix that. So simple stuff like that, Sol hint can help you out quite a lot. So I would say when you're writing your Solidity code, uh, those two would be your friends. Moving on, the next two packages, webc.py, and Populous. Web3.py is the backbone of all of your development framework that you would require. Populous is another package that is has been built, uh, that uses Web3 to make everything even easier for you. So what does Web3 itself allow you to do? Now we are talking about Ethereum blockchain, right? Um, so the end point of that blockchain has to be sitting around somewhere. Next thing, you want to encode and decode your data. That is where Web3 is also useful. You want to send, receive money. Web3 helps you over there as well. Um, you want to check about, you want to check some details of a particular block transaction. Again, it helps you. It even helps you mine. However, I won't recommend that on production. Web3 is uh, a Python version of Web3.js, which uh, if you're into blockchains, you might have heard of that one. It's very similar to that. The way to install that would be pip3 install Web3. Now let's look at some Solidity code. Uh, so I started with the really basic version that we are going to be trying and then deploying it on the blockchain that we will run internally. So the sample code is of a contract called direction. As you can see, the first line actually says uh, pragma solidity. So over there, it's simply saying that I'm going to be using a source code that is compatible with at least 0417 version of my compiler. Anything lesser, it will not compile. So let's say you're trying to run it against a sol solid sol C with version 0416, it will not run because like I said, it's wild west, right? Things are changing as fast as lightning. Daily, there might be a new package that is coming up. Solidity, the Sol C also keeps changing. They keep on adding features. So you need to ensure that your code is working with it. So that is there for the first line. About the contract direction, that's your smart contract. Now, this smart contract, we are going to be trying and deploying it on the blockchain. What it does is you have a choice. You're going in a certain direction. Let's say you want to change your direction to the right side. So the second last line, function set right, is you're cho changing your choice to the right side. That's all there is to it. Intentionally, I've kept it extremely simple of set right and get choice because I want to set something and I want to get the data back that what is my current state of choice. Also, I must also mention, enums are not supported like how Python su supports enum. So you won't see the, the zero for left, one for right. So keeping that in mind, what do we really need to run this code on the blockchain? Actually, it's not too many steps. It's literally just three steps. The first thing that you need 
we have that contract already written. You need to compile it. That's the first step. The second step is we need to deploy it on a blockchain. Somewhere this blockchain is running, and I want to deploy it. After you have deployed it, you have those options of setting the right direction or getting what is your direction right now. It's all about using it then. So just three steps. Let's go and see how to do all of those. So first things first, you get your import site. Sol C is for compiling it. Web C is for managing all of my byte codes that, I'm, that I have compiled, putting that into the blockchain, getting an instance out of it, of the blockchain, and then running some action on it. That's all we need to do. So the setup first is, um, this is why I need to explain a little bit. You have some smart contract. You have some code that you want to deploy. It is going to be on a distributed network. Everybody will have it. So now, who owns this smart contract that you're going to deploy? That is where the second line comes useful. Somebody needs to own it and say that, hey, this, this thing belongs to me. Otherwise, uh, bad things can happen. The first line is we are trying to create a test blockchain setup internally within the code itself, just so that we can run the code. We don't have to connect to an external chain. It will be just our own code creating an own instance of the blockchain. Next thing, we need to compile it. So compilation, as you can see, the first line says, solc.compile source. You get an interface back, the, compiled, uh, the contract interface. Now this contract interface can have two things. My, the byte quotes, because when you deploy it, it will be just about bytes. The blockchain doesn't know anything else because it's literally just lots of blocks within containing all lots of bytes. Another thing is uh, you might see in the second last line, ABI is equal to contract interface ABI. That is the application by the interface. The smart contract that you have written, what are the possible actions or steps that you can take on top of that smart contract? That is where ABI comes in. So it gives you a hint of what are the things that you can do with it, and byte code, conversion of your source code into a byte code that will go into the blockchain. Compiled it, we want to deploy it. The deployment is fairly straightforward. We get the direction smart contract, and we call transact on top of it, which actually deploys it. Next thing is also an interesting concept in blockchain. If you are taking, if you're calling upon an action on a blockchain, it will take at least 10, especially in a production setup. So if you're trying to deploy, you have to wait for a while. You have to go back for your coffee, come back again, see if it really worked. So you have to wait for that transaction to be finished. Once that's done, now you can actually create a contract, the direction contract, and interact with it. So first things first, creating an instance of the direction contract by giving it the address. The up. After we have deployed it and we get the transaction, that gives us the address as well, that this is your address on the production or the test blockchain setup. You can use that address and you can give it the ABI. ABI is, like I said, the hints for your smart contracts. So now when you uh, have the instance, you can call upon any function of that direction smart contract. One of those uh, options was get choice. So you get the choice and you print it uh, yourself right after that. If you, okay, I should also mention, you notice over here there's the first line, choice is equal to something, is ending with dot call. There's a difference in how blockchain calls are made to the blockchain, whether it is read or write. When it is a read, it is a dot call. When it is a write, the write means you're changing every node's value that it contains because there are thousands of people connected to the blockchain, right? So now you're trying to change some value that exists in that blockchain. So you have to say that you have to 
announce yourself that I'm going to make a transaction. And that transaction will change everybody's blockchain. So that's the difference. Again, you need to wait for the transaction. As you can see, there's a pattern over here. That something on the blockchain, you need to wait for it. Now let's look at all of the source code together. You try to compile it. You create a test Ethereum blockchain that you will run within yourself. I will come back to this uh, topic of uh, connecting to the blockchain eventually uh, as to how to change it to something in real production. That's fairly easy as well, almost like this line. Create a sample account that you will need. Create the direc direction contract. Deploy it. Wait for it. Create an instance of the direction contract that you will use. Get the options. Transact. Set the direction to right. When you run it, uh, then again, find out the actual details. Then when you run it, you see something like this. Where initially what we were doing, so let's go back to a little bit. In my first print, I'm taking the default choice, whatever it is it is without setting anything. Next, I change it to right. And again, I wait for the transaction before I print it again. So that's what happens. It's the simplest example of uh, writing your own smart contract, deploying it on the blockchain, and actually calling upon an action on that blockchain itself, modifying that blockchain, whatever is running and then seeing the results of it. Now you might have noticed a pattern that every time you call upon a function, every time you say, I want to do this, you have to wait for the transaction. So how do we handle that better? In Web3, you can do something like wait for the seed and say that uh, this action I'm calling, please keep on waiting until you get a receipt. And the receipt is going to be yay or nay eventually. So you wait for it, and you come back, and you can simply say, transact, uh, and then wait for the receipt. How do we handle the deployment better? You might have noticed there were two steps. One of them was, first we, create an, first we create the smart contract by compiling it, get the bytes code, get the ABI, and then we deploy it on the blockchain. And we get the instance of the blockchain that we can use to interact with it. So over here, W3 is the web3 dot et dot contract and you call upon the constructor trans call the transact this is how you deploy it any other contract can be deployed like this before we move on uh, I must say this just for showing that how would you call upon these functions how would you simplify it when we move to an example like populous it gets even simpler so don't worry about having to remember all of this. Eventually, down the line, it, it is all in single line. Some of the examples of uh, Web3 I wanted to show, uh, like how is it really useful. So one of the examples is over here, you're trying to connect to a provider. Your provider can be of any type. You could have a web socket, you could have HTTP socket, or you could have uh, IPC provider. So if you're running locally, for example, most of the times I would say it is um, IPC that you're trying to connect to. If you're trying to connect to a network outside, that time you might uh, need to use HTTP provider, for example, or preferred one would be WebSocket. One of the latest ones these days that is out there in the Ethereum, and that is uh, used quite a lot by other people for their own testing is uh, infura.io. So up till now, what I've been talking about is you write your own source code, you run it, and uh, you get the response right away. It is really fast. But let's say you want to test it with a real test network that is out there in public. That would be Ringby that everybody uses. But again, if you use something on the outside, you, will, you might have to wait for a short while you might have to go for the coffee, come back, and then see how it works out. So this is a sample of a ring by connection. 
this uh, me running it on the console the moment i run this uh, ring by connection i can even get something like the block number so that means this the latest block number on that uh, chain and this uh, connected to the http provider these are some of the examples of uh, web3 you can have uh, provider is uh, who is so how do you connect to that uh, blockchain endpoint accounts and the block number is you could have your own accounts that you're trying to manage you could get details on a particular block itself so every time a transaction gets mined on that blockchain so I'm, i won't go too much into detail of the blockchain itself uh, i'll try to leave that out but essentially every time something gets mined uh, on the blockchain you're saving it as a block and you can retrieve the actions everything that happened on that block by calling upon this function so one of the examples over here is uh, inside the third transaction how how many counts to, uh, how many transactions do you see this is where it uh, also gets interesting for uh, regular people you sometimes you might, might want to transfer some money to or transfer some uh, ethereum to other people how would you call upon your code to actually do that you could do that you could uh, run it locally write your python code figure out that uh, this is the uh, this the amount i want to send what is the actual value in ether and send it uh, on the other side the other interesting concept is the last one over here that is uh, that i would like to bring to your attention uh, and it's, uh, it's an it's an idea that i have only recently seen in blockchains when you call upon an action i was talking about it takes you some amount of time because you are changing everybody's value so now there is a price for that right because you can't change thousands of computers uh, computer notes you can't change their value without actually paying some price for it so this is where it becomes useful is because you can say i want to change my direction to right set right but how much gas gas is the price so how much gas do i need to pay for it you can ask that first before you make that actual transaction so let's say there's uh, the price is really big you don't want to do that right now and web3 helps you with all of that so coming to populous next it's um, says development framework for ethereum i see that as a swiss knife for everything on blockchain development for ethereum it helps you do everything that we have spoken so far and then make it uh, at least three times easier so let's see how that happens uh, i wrote this over here th so this is an interesting problem it's it's a wild west uh, problem right things are moving at lightning speed you write some code today you come back you upgrade your python packages suddenly it won't work 3 days later so if something works for you and you are testing your code please commit that code right away so because there is going to be one package that will mess up everything really badly for you and you won't know how to go back to your previous version so if you install populous today it will not actually work unless you next then the next two lines as well and this by the way happened with me just 3 days ago because i was like let's run it one more time to ensure that this works <coughs> the way populous works is that uh, it helps you create a project it's almost like um, if you if you have done django before you run django admin start project and you get everything baked in similarly populous you say populous in it suddenly it creates a uh, it converts that current folder into something that you can actually start using for your test uh, writing your smart contracts testing them and even running them uh, on the console so it creates a directory called uh, contracts and test those are the starting starting ones that you can have now how about using it it's a package populous is a package so the way now you would run your code is that your current directory needs to know about this populous project 
So you s declare yourself as uh, a populist project, and that's where we go on from there. Compiling your source code is also easy with Populous. You can say something as simple as uh, Populous compile. In that current folder, it will compile all the contracts for you. Having said that, th this just so that, uh, let's say you're trying to run something with solhint, for example. You have some custom command. You want to compile it first for whatever reason. If you're running anything with Populous and you run it on the console, let's say, or on the IDE, if it notices a change, it automatically compiles your Solidity code. So what it means is that you don't have to rerun your command all the times now. Populous also helps you maintain a separate blockchain for your testing. This uh, another concept. So earlier I was talking about you run your code, you deploy it, and you use it. But the problem comes in. Let's say you wanted to save the state of whatever smart contract that you have. Let's say you wanted to save that right <coughs> choice, that right direction. How do you do that? That would be done through setting up a new chain. So when you do, it helps you create separate uh, instances of the chains. What it does is that you can maintain with Populous three or four, as many chains as you feel like run different scenarios on each one of them as you go along. So it gets really easy for testing. So once you create a chain like uh, named Horton, this is what you get. Um, and like I said, it saves the state for you. You can stop your project, come back to it five or six days later, and it will continue from the point where you were last running. So what it means, let's say your ICO that you're trying to run has got seven or eight steps. Now you can run them one by one, save it in a state somewhere, and come back to it anytime with Populous. Now let's look at one sample crowd sale ICO smart contract. It's really easy. I've done it intentionally. You buy something. You can forward the funds to somebody. You want to ensure that uh, it is a valid purchase. And now if you're going to be running an ICO, you also want to set a time limit that it will end at this particular time. The way to deploy that with Populous would be project.getChain as chain. So you get the chain, which is a blockchain. And you call the contract. You're giving it a name with cloud sale. So that means now I'm not saying this is my ABI, this is my source byte codes. You simply say, I want to deploy cloud sale. And Populous has the choice to get or deploy the contract. So I want to go back to this uh, slide again. So if you noticed, a lot of shortcuts have been taken over here. You, you have written your code. You're not converting that into byte codes. There is no deployment, uh, individual deployment. There is no waiting for transaction. Everything is taken care of for you. Next thing, now that you've deployed the ICO on the blockchain, next thing you want to find out is, I have got uh, 0.0001 Ether, and I want to buy some buy a token. How would somebody else do that? So this, let's say, somebody else doing the transaction. So they would say cloud sale dot transact. It is from my account to to the sender account, and this is the value that I want to buy. As simple as that. So when somebody so when somebody is Buying your token from the exchange, literally that is what is happening. A few lines of code. Your smart contract might have some status within it. So all of the other functions uh, that you could call, has the cap been reached? Has the goal been reached? You can call upon all of those functions using Populous as well. Uh, coming to testing, Populous, uh, if, if you've used uh, PyTest fixtures, Populous gives you baked in fixtures like chain, registrar, provider, and web3. So when you start to write your unit test, everything comes in free for you. You can simply call upon chain and get the results. So one example would be test direction, and you send in the chain. Chain is the 
fixture provided by Populous. You say chain dot provider get to deploy the direction contract, and you assert upon that. Uh, again, really simple. <coughs> you don't have to write uh, long winded uh, unit tests for yourself. You can even simplify the testing by writing your own fixtures. Like uh, I currently, I had to write a lot of lines for my direction contract. Now. To deploy it every time, I don't want to literally get or call get or deploy every time. So I can write something like uh, direction contract uh, as a fixture, and eventually it uh, goes into test direction right uh, baked in. That's uh, so. That's all for the smart contracts and deployment and how to use them. Lots of other things that I've not covered. So what are some of those? Uh, one of them would be MIST. It's, uh, you can think of it as a browser for your distributed apps that you're trying to deploy on people, uh, on different nodes. How to interact against that? You can check your account on MIST. It's uh, kind of like UI version of uh, your contracts when it actually goes out into production. Remix IDE is a b website uh, you go over there, you can write your smart contracts, you can test against it uh, all on the website. So instead, let's say you, didn't, you don't want to write your Python first, you want to literally test your smart contract first, the Remix IDE would be the, I would say the best place to start off. Etherscan, all of those transactions, all of those blocks, they're going somewhere. They're going to etherscan.io. That information is available. It's kind of like uh, Google for your Ethereum blocks. MetaMask is an extension on Google Chrome. Helps you do some of the tasks that Web3 does, but on a UI. S uh, smart contract best practices uh, that is available by consensus. Uh, once I provide you the link later, you can actually go and see those. Before you write your smart contracts, you should definitely read some of them over there. The actual source code the one that I showed today is available on PyCon SG smart contracts on my GitHub repo. You can see that. That will make it easier. Uh, to run those uh, two individual things, the direction example, for example, uh, you would just have to do python direction.py, and it will run everything for you. Um, and to do the ICO thing, ICO is a little bit more complex, so I've kept that in a separate repo with all individual steps as well. So you can go through a series of steps. Takes you through the whole process. Um, thanks for your time. I'm happy to hear any questions. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Do we have any questions? No one? Seriously? Sorry, I didn't get you. You could do that. You could write that into the smart contract as well. However, um, I want to go back uh, to my point about uh, gas. Every time you call upon an action, you're paying with the gas. You're paying a price for it. So does it really make sense to save that in the blockchain? Perhaps not. However, if that's your model, if that, that's the idea you're going with, because it's, uh, it could be really useful to present that to the whole world, then yes, then save it over there. Otherwise, uh, the way I've seen that is that most of the companies uh, create their own website as a front to the ICO itself, where the ICO is simply to take in the money. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? So, what is uh, Python for uh, smart contracts? Um, over, are you saying over JavaScript? Or, or other tools, or other ways? The other one that I've seen is a Truffle framework, where you need to know JavaScript really well to do that. Uh, when I was getting into ICO scene, I started, I'm 
not that great at JavaScript. So it was really hard for me to write all of that uh, code uh, in JavaScript and keep on. To, so for example, we were talking about Web3. When you go into Truffle Framework, you have to write all of that uh, source code on your own. With something like Populous, it uh, becomes so simple that you literally have to just write your smart contract. And then any action that you want to take on it can be written in a simple Python one or two lines. So that's, that's why it's useful to me. Is it possible to do an XDO without listing an exchange? Without? Listing an exchange. So without paying a fee. You, you, you could do that. However, your marketing has to be really good. Because now your, your company's face has to show up literally everywhere. And keep, keep in mind, some Google, something like Google, Google or Facebook, they have uh, disallowed uh, ads for ICO. So you can't really say that I'm running an ICO, please pay me over Google or Facebook anymore. So you, your medium of uh, access to the greater public is much more reduced now. Thank you. OK. Uh, let's have another round of applause for Abhishek. Uh, thank you very much for your talk and for the for us today.